Okay, here we are, part two. Um, oh God, it's, it's hot in here, excuse me, I gotta turn the fan on. Um, okay, hope that doesn't make all my papers blow away. Um, all right, um, yeah, part two. Okay, so Pete, so far so good. It seems like he's got uh, the basic survival skills in place, you know. Um, so how well does he do? Well, so far, so good for Pete. He seems to manage just fine until, and some of you commented on this, and I was really, really uh, proud of you. A, a lot of you, a y'all offered some really nice interpretive uh, insights into Pete's character. Um, so everything's just fine uh, until, look over on page 50 excuse me, 57, this is towards the very end of the book with Pete. We see what happens to him. Um, okay, so at this point, he has seduced and abandoned Maggie. And, um, you know, um, and then so what happens? You know, Nellie comes along and essentially seduces and abandons Pete. And so this is a wonderful bit of complexity in here. Let me show you what I mean. Um, well, let, let's just read the passage and then we'll pick it apart, okay? Um, so this is after Pete is seduced and abandoned Maggie. This is beginning of chapter 18, okay, page 56. So here he is, we know Pete is, has dumped Maggie and he's off running around with Nellie. In a partitioned off section of a saloon sat a man, and that's Pete, with half a dozen women, gleefully laughing, laughing, hovering about him. So it seems like he's on top of the world. Um, well, not so fast. Let's watch what happens to Pete here. Um, over on page 57. Um, so Pete, of course, is very drunk now, right? Um, this is how he talks. Um, uh, yeah, okay. Trying to get in character here. <laughs> he knows how to treat a feller, and I stays by you till I spend the last cent. That's right. I'm a good feller, and I knows when anybody treats me right. I should have a bottle of whiskey here, but I don't, sorry. So um, over on page 58, a little bit more. So he's very, very drunk, okay? Having a good time, right? With these women uh, over and Nellie over on 58, skip a full page down where I just left off. That's right, hailed a woman. That's right. You're no blooming Jay. You spend your money like a man. That's right. So they're puffing him up and he just thinks that's great. The man pounded on the table with quivering fists. Yes, sir, he cried with deep earnestness as if someone disputed him. That's interesting, right? What's disputing him? It's his conscience is disputing him. All right, I'll come back to that in a second. I think that's important. Look over on page 59 now. Um, now... I always treat you square, didn't I? You likes me, don't you know? I'm a good feller. So he needs constant reassurance from Nell that he's a good guy, okay? That's a little like Maggie needing reassurance from Pete. He's now needing that from Nell. Is Nell someone anyone should be trusting, right? Okay, um, I love Nell, by the way. Um, okay, and then finally, this is how this whole scene ends. Bottom of 59, uh, this is the, yeah, this is the very end of chapter, um, chapter 18. So they're all sitting at the table, and he's got a, a, oh, look at this. I've actually got a tankard sitting right here. Okay, he's got a, his tankard of ale, right? Um, um, all right. Finally, he lurched forward and fell groaning to the floor. Women screamed in disgust and drew back their skirts. Come on, cried one, starting up angrily. Let's get out of here. 
the woman of brilliance and audacity, that's Nellie. I love this woman, by the way. I have a secret crush on Nellie. The woman of brilliance and audacity stayed behind, taking up the bills and stuffing them into a deep, irregularly shaped pocket. A guttural snore from the recumbent man caused her to turn and look down at him. Not just literally, but figuratively, too. Nell has won. Um, she laughed. What a damn fool, she said, and went. Wow. Okay. There's a lot in this passage. Pete has a conscience. He feels horrible about what he did to Maggie, and he needs to have his conscience um, salved somehow by Nellie and the others, uh, and he needs to have it salved by drinking a lot of alcohol because he feels so badly, all right? So what's the takeaway message here? Um, it's hard not to say. You know, maybe the takeaway message is in the Bowery, you cannot have a conscience. Having a conscience will kill you. Or at the very least, make you drunk and passed out and give others the opportunity to take advantage of you. Okay? Or remember in Jack London, in the, in the Yukon, right? If you show compassion or kindness to another or friendliness, that's interpreted as weakness and you're literally going to get devoured. So is that the takeaway message here? And this is what I mean by the dark comedy, right? Um, we could easily come away from this novel and think that ironically enough, um, Crane is trying to tell us not to have a conscience. <laughs> Whoa! Um, but again, if you put this in some biographical perspective, um, that look at this in, in large measure for what it is. Um, it's, an adult, it's a work of adolescent rebelliousness, you know. All right, mom and dad, here's your conscience for you. Are you all happy, right? But maybe, just maybe, um, we can flip this, what I just said, on its head and take another look at it. That maybe somehow Crane is trying to say that the Pete's and Jimmy's of the world do need to look at their conscience to one degree or another that if they did listen to their conscience, they wouldn't do those bad things to Maggie and others like her, so then they won't turn around and uh, commit acts of self-destruction. If you do bad things to other people, your conscience will then weaken you, okay? Perhaps the novel is, is saying that, you know, don't seduce and abandon women. Uh, you'll end up a miserable wretch like, uh, like Pete. But if that's the case, you know, then what about Jimmy? I mean, Jimmy has seduced and abandoned women, but he doesn't appear to fall apart the way Pete did. So I, I don't know, you know. And, and that's not to say that I don't know, that I just haven't done my homework or something. I just think it's open to interpretation. So I'm just simply presenting those different interpretive strategies to you so that um, you can make your own choice about it, okay? But I will say this, at the very least, uh, Crane is wanting to uh, take a great big swipe at the contemporary morality of his parents, his mother and father. At the very least, he's wanting to say that day to day, typical morality uh, won't get you very far in the Bowery. At least day-to-day -day conventional middle-class morality is really being held up to uh, interrogation, all right? I think at the very least that's what's happening. Okay. Um, okay, so, all right, now, on to, on to Nellie. As, as someone pointed out, Nellie doesn't show up here very much. I think maybe I want to talk about her. Like I say, uh, this is going on YouTube, so the whole world will say, 
I was going to say don't tell anyone, but everyone, the whole world can find out. I have a huge crush on Nellie. I really do. But don't tell anyone. <laughs> I think Nellie's pretty awesome. And again, this is supposed to be funny, too. Um, and that's why I'm laughing. The woman of brilliance and audacity, right? Um, this is a woman who's not going to fall apart. She is built to survive. And so, again, Nellie's the kind of woman that... Um, Nellie is the kind... What did Rick James call women like this, right? Uh, she's the kind of, kind of woman you don't take home to your mother. <laughs> that's Rick James saying it, not me, okay? But, um, and that's exactly what, you know, Stephen Crane's adolescent sort of act of rebelliousness is saying, you know... She's, you know, saying, okay, good girls like Maggie, mom and dad, that you would like me to uh, take home to meet you. They, they're, they're fools and they don't do so well. It's the Nellies. They're the ones built to survive, right? So again, this is Crane, I think, mocking his parents' morality. So let's look at Nellie. Um, if you look over on page 45, okay, so here she is, a woman of brilliance and audacity. That's repeated in here, you know, she is. So this is chapter 14, about one page in. A woman of brilliance and audacity, accompanied by a mere boy, right, came into the place and took their seats near them. Okay, and then skipping down, Pete and Nellie uh, start talking to each other. What's that meme that's in circulation? Um, you see it like a guy's walking down the street with his girlfriend, and then this other woman walks by, and he's turning and kind of checking her out, and then his girlfriend looks at him horrified. Okay, that's what's happening right here, okay? Um, so this is Pete checking out Nellie. I thought you were gone for good, began Pete at once. When did you get back? How did that buffalo business turn out? The woman shrugged her shoulders. Well, he didn't have as many stamps as he tried to make out. So I shook him. That's all. So, yeah, I mean, unapologetically, without conscience, without conscience, that's the key. Nellie was chasing after a guy for money, and he didn't have it. So she dumped him, okay? Maybe that's what you gotta do to survive. Um, okay, and then if you look over on page 59, uh, um, okay, yeah, actually, never mind. We already looked at that passage. So that's, that's Nellie, the woman of brilliance and audacity. And maybe, again, for Maggie to survive, she would have to be like Nellie. That's deeply ironic, okay? Because this is at the time, we've talked about true womanhood. So, you, you know, you, you all are experts. Maggie, at this stage of the book, is still a true woman. She's domestic. She's trying to make her home as miserable as it is a beautiful place to be. She's submissive, you know, to a fault. She goes along with Pete, you know, and that submissiveness is what gets her into trouble because, you know, she's... Uh, seducible basically um, she's she's pure at this stage all right um, you know all these things so she is Maggie is the definition of true womanhood um, and uh, but true womanhood is gonna get you killed okay you see Nellie is not a true woman she's not domestic she is not pure, and she is definitely not submissive, okay? However, she, sur she survives, okay? So I think you get it. So you very much, I think Crane intends us to contrast Nellie and Maggie um, and to come up with ironic, maybe even deeply, darkly comic um, uh, final conclusions.
Okay, so now Maggie, um, if you look over on page 16, it's already talked about that she is the, the true woman. Um, you know, pure, submissive, domestic. And you see this, this is the beginning of chapter five. The girl Maggie, what a wonderful passage this is. This is deeply memorable. The girl Maggie blossomed in a mud puddle. <laughs> What an image, and I think it's supposed to be funny in a Stephen Crane dark comedy kind of way. She grew to be a most rare and wonderful production of a tenement district, a pretty girl. None of the dirt of Rum Alley seemed to be in her veins. The philosophers upstairs, downstairs on the same floor puzzled over it. So some of you commented on very nicely uh, Maggie, in a very remarkable fashion, seems to be surviving, more than surviving, sur surviving. she's thriving um, in spite of this horrific mess uh, that she lives in. But as, but as we see, you know, it's going to catch up with her. She had to develop the survival skills like Nellie, and she doesn't. Okay, and then, as a lot of you pointed out, um, that attraction for um, Pete is what does her in. So let's examine that. Um, look over at the very end of chapter five, beginning of chapter six. Um, yeah, okay. So yeah, I mean, what we know about the good girl, the true woman, if she preserves and takes care of herself in this fashion, you know, your Prince Charming is going to show up. Your knight in shining armor is just going to show up. You know, there's that Cinderella story or the Sleeping Beauty story. You can be subject to all these horrible things, but, a, but the fairy tale story has it that a man is going to ride into her rescue. And so you see what Crane is up to. Crane is saying that's living in fantasy land. Um, that's the stuff of popular romance. And if you get that gunk in your head too much, it's going to get you killed. Um, in that sense, you have Crane doing the same thing that Mark Twain was doing and some of the other writers we were looking at this semester. Well, all the semester, Henry James and the Bostonians, you know, the transcendentalists often make believe land of their popular romances or the Grangerfords and Shepherdsons, their make-believe, oh, we're, you know, like English royalty, having our noble, honorable feuds and all that. And Twain's just like, y'all are just full of crap. And all that gunk in your head, you gotta get it out. Because all that is, is a nice shiny veneer over deeply murderous tendencies that has gotten a lot of people killed including the hundreds of thousands of people in the Civil War, all right? So, uh, so yeah, Crane's doing the same thing. Maggie has her head stuffed with all this make-believe romantic nonsense that all you have to do is be a good girl in a conventional sense, and a man's going to take care of you. And it doesn't work that way, Crane is trying to say. So, well, Pete shows up. So Maggie's been a good girl, so she believes, and she believes these popular stories. And so Pete comes along, so she just assumes. She's in denial, and she's overlaying her understanding of what Pete is over top of who he really is. So she's not able to perceive the reality of Pete. She's perceiving only her fantasy of Pete. And y'all have never done that, have you? Uh, you start dating someone and you they turn out to be very different than who you thought they were, right? Um, this is what Maggie is doing to, a, to really a darkly comic degree. And for Crane, Maggie's attraction for Pete is supposed to be funny in a darkly comic, even perverse kind of way, all right? You always know what it's dark comedy if you start laughing 
and then you look at yourself and you think, what the heck's wrong with me? I'm some kind of sicko for thinking that's funny. Then you know it's dark comedy, all right? I think there's dark comedy here, all right? Ready? Here we go. So um, here is uh, Pete first shows up. Okay, very end of chapter five on page 19. Pete's aristocratic person looked as if it might soil. Okay, that's funny. Uh, she looked keenly at him, occasionally wondering if he was feeling contempt, but Pete seemed to be enveloped in reminiscence. Um, so yeah, Pete, an aristocrat? Wow, Maggie ain't in reality, okay? Um, Holy G, said he, those mugs can't phase me. They knows I can wipe the street with any tree of them. Maggie perceived that here was the beau ideal of a man. Her dim thoughts were often searching for faraway lands where, as God says, the little hills sing together in the morning. Under the trees of her dream gardens, there had always walked a lover. So she's falling for this guy. Falling for this guy. Think he's an aristocrat. Okay. Next chapter now. Pete took note of Maggie. <laughs> Say, Mag, I'm stuck on your shape. It's out of sight, he said, parenthetically with an affable grin. <laughs> That's her aristocratic gentleman. <laughs> Guys, remember that pickup line, all right? No, no, sorry, don't remember that pickup line. But, you know, think of the worst pickup line you've ever heard, okay? Say, Mag, I'm stuck on your shape. That should never work on anyone. <laughs> you've gotta do a lot better than that, Pete. So you see what I'm getting at? This is the reality. Pete is not an aristocrat. He is not even a gentleman. Yet Maggie has her head filled with all this, you know, romantic gunk, and she can't tell the difference, okay? So if there is one moral message that might come out of this, it is similar to what we would see in other books we've looked at this semester, and that is get into reality. You know, I remember the first day of class, I was pointing at Jesus. I was saying, Jesus, wake up and smell the coffee. All right, we're getting that here, okay? That would be one moral message of this story. Don't believe that romantic gunk. It gets people killed, okay. Okay, um, he walked to and fro, I'm still on page 19. He walked to and fro in the room, uh, which seemed then to grow even smaller and unfit to hold his dignity, the attribute of a supreme warrior. <laughs> this is supposed to be funny, guys, all right? And I, and I hope you can see the comedy, I, I really do. It's okay to laugh, all right, I promise. Um, okay, um, look over on page 20. Just the next page into chapter, uh, chapter six. Um, okay, with Jimmy and his company, company, Pete departed in a sort of blaze of glory, like the supreme warrior he is, from the Johnson home, right? Um, and here's, here's Maggie's fantasy life about him. Here was a formidable man who disdained the strength of a world full of fists. Here was one who had contempt for brass clothed power. One whose knuckles could defiantly ring against the granite of law. He was a knight. Oh my gosh, if this doesn't make you groan, I don't know what to say, you know? So again, these kinds of pretensions, right? 
don't believe it. Skip down a few lines. Okay. She wondered what Pete dined on. Wow. Um, she reflected upon the collar and cuff factory. It began to appear to her mind as a dreary place of endless grinding. Pete's elegant occupation brought him, no doubt, into contact with people who had money and manners. Yeah, right. Okay, so again, Pete's going to whisk her out of that, uh, you know, collar factory, introduce her to the best society, and he and she are going to be like the prince and princess living, living happily ever after, right? Um, skip down a few lines. To her, the earth was composed of hardships and insults. She felt instant admiration for a man who openly defied it. So, you know, here's a man that's going to ride in and rescue her. And don't we, and you know, and let's not be too hard on Maggie. You know, as someone pointed out, um, you know, look at what Maggie grew up on, you know. Her mother and father weren't there to take care of her. So Maggie, psychologists today talk about adults with what we call unmet dependency needs. That means you, you didn't have a mother and father there uh, who, who took care of you and nurtured and felt people let children feel safe and secure and protected and nurtured and all those things, okay? So if people go into adulthood with all those unmet needs, they'll look to the Pete's of the world to try to meet them. So, yes, we can laugh a little bit at, at Maggie and, and you know her silly imagination, but look at what Maggie has gone through. She didn't get what she needed growing up. So, you know, of course, she's going to fall victim to someone like Pete, you know? Um, in this, in this sense, it's, it's not funny. If you look at it from that angle, the dark comedy evaporates and you feel a real sense of tragedy that is Maggie, right? Okay. Um, okay. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah. Okay. Where did I leave off? Mm -hmm. Okay. Over on page 23. Okay, yeah, so here they are at, at you know, he, he takes her out, you know, and this is his fine aristocratic uh, manners um, and his, uh, his certain savoir faire. Savoir faire, that's French for you just know what to do, right, in polite society. This is Pete's savoir faire, right? Um, chapter 7. It was obvious that Pete had been to this place many times before and was very familiar with it. A knowledge of this fact made Maggie feel little and new. He was extremely gracious and attentive. He displayed the consideration of a cultured gentleman who knew what was due. Say, what the hell? Bring the lady a big glass. What the hell is the use of that pony? This is supposed to be funny. For me, it's funny. Or maybe I'm just a sicko. You can decide, all right? Don't be fresh now, said the waiter with some warmth and departed. Ah, eh, get off the earth, said Pete. After the other's retreating form, Maggie perceived that Pete brought forth all his elegance and all his knowledge of high-class customs. Telling the waiter to go to hell, that's high-class, right? Uh, for her benefit, her heart warmed as she reflected upon his condescension. Oh boy, okay, all right, enough said. I think you get it. Okay, uh, I think that's probably enough for part two. Let me stop there and then we'll pick up on this and wrap up in part three. Okay, if you can bear any more, that is. All right, well, stay tuned. There's more fun and games, I promise.